In episode 8 of the new TV show Shogun, Bontaro invites his wife Mariko over for tea. As he prepares the tea, he asks her in Japanese, do you want to commit lover suicide? Lover suicide was a widespread phenomenon in feudal Japan. The practice is referred to today by modern scholars as Shinju. Japanese society's eagerness to embrace various forms of voluntary death as legitimate, even positive behavior with a potentially redemptive value is well known. While suicide is not prevalent in Japan, it is historically widely revered if undertaken for morally justifiable reasons in response to societal pressures. Examples of this include self-sacrifice as a way to exercise shame, to highlight honor, dignity, and integrity. Over Japanese history, there were many instances where self-sacrifice was esteemed as honorable, inevitable, or even desirable. One example includes harakiri, or seppuku, a ritualized act of self-disembowelment, observed predominantly by the higher samurai class, often in allegiance to their lord. This could also be performed as a way of protesting against someone, which is also shown in the same episode of Shogun. Another famous and more recent example is the kamikaze, the Japanese soldiers who crashed their planes onto allied military targets during the Second World War. Finally, we have the ancient practice of Shinjushi, lover suicide, which is alleged to in the scene of Shogun we are analyzing today. Many viewers of the show probably find the concept of honorable self-sacrifice challenging to understand while watching Shogun. Western perspectives on suicide are largely shaped by a Christian narrative emphasizing the potential for eternal damnation. In contrast, within Japanese Pure Land Buddhism, this narrative undergoes a complete reversal. Today, I aim to offer some insight into the motivations behind this societal practice in Japanese history. The practice of harakiri has been analyzed ad nauseatum over history by scholars. However, in this episode, I aim to shift the focus to the lesser-known practice of Shinju in feudal Japan, using the tea scene in Shogun as a focal point. At the same time, I want to provide insight into the romantic dynamics and the relationships within Japanese Edo feudal society, particularly focusing on courtesans and their patrons. Check out my video about the history of geishas in the link above to learn more about courtesans and geisha in Japanese history. Quick disclaimer, I want to make it clear that I don't intend to defend or promote suicide in any way. My goal is solely to provide some insights into Japanese history. Shinju historically holds a more complex meaning than simply lover's suicide. Shinju as a concept has been around since the Heian period when it was performed for religious or romantic reasons. It is important to note that before Shinju became known as lover's suicide, there were various types of Shinju. Originally, prior to the 18th century, Shinju was defined as any act by which a person demonstrated his or her love for another. This was widely performed by the lower castes of Edo society, and particularly the yujo, prostitutes of the Yoshiwara pleasure quarters. Yujo were at the bottom of society's scale, close to outcasts. Essentially sex slaves, their fate was less than viable. To rise rank into the pleasure quarters and improve the societal condition, they had two options. They needed to either bring more money to their house or convince one of their patrons to buy them out of their contract. The best way to achieve either goal was to try to convince their clients that their love for them was real rather than being motivated by money. If a client was convinced the courtesan's love was real, they might be more inclined to frequently come back to them rather to go to another prostitute, therefore bringing more money to their house. Although frowned upon by society, wealthy samurai also frequented these pleasure districts. If a courtesan could convince such a rich patron through the means of romance to buy them out of their contract, their lives could drastically improve. Fujimoto Kizan, a famous Japanese 17th century scholar, was one of those patrons. Kizan wrote a detailed historical account of the pleasure quarters in his book Shikido Okagami, published in 1678. In his book, Kizan dedicates a whole chapter to Shinju. 
which was then the most widespread method used by courtesans to convince their patrons slash lovers of their true authentic feelings towards them. Kizan details six different types of Shinju in order of gravity practiced by the courtesans of his time, tearing off a nail, the vow, haircutting, tattooing a lover's name, cutting off a finger, and piercing the flesh with a blade tip. Some Yujos would tattoo themselves from head to toe for a faithless lover, while others would go as far as to cut off their fingers. Shinju was such a common practice in 17th century Japan that all the necessary paraphernalia was readily available in most shops around town. Another scholar of the time, Santo Kyoden, notes that all the instruments needed for cutting off a finger are to be found in all the shops where one can acquaint oneself with them. The ancient custom of Shinju is today all but forgotten. Yakuza, of course, still resort to finger amputation to demonstrate loyalty or atone for misdeeds. However, today the practice of Shinju is colloquially and often translated in the media as lover's suicide. How did this practice evolve over time? Before we continue, if you haven't already done so, please don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this video. My goal is to reach 500 subscribers so I can continue making great content for all of you. Please also check out the previous video I made about Shogun, The Real History. I will leave the link to this video in the top right corner above. As I just explained, in Kizan's time, Shinju was not widely known as lover's suicide. Shinju was used to refer to the different levels of extremes a courtesan would resort to to prove her love to a patron. The definition of Shinju as lover's suicide only developed some 20 years after his time, with the popularization of kabuki and bunraku plays on the topic by the famous playwright Chinkamatsu Monzaemon. Shikamatsu's most famous plays on the topic are Sonezaki Shinju and Shinju Ten no Amijima. In these two plays, Shinju refers to two people choosing suicide to extricate themselves from a miserable situation, representing the final consummation of their forbidden love. Most of the characters in his plays are of lowly status. For example, a townsman or a samurai destroys his social standing after falling in love with a lowly courtesan. This townsman or samurai is then unable to buy out the courtesan's contract and fulfill their love, having spent all their fortune into the pleasure quarters. The character is thus torn between his duties to his wife, family and class, and his love for the courtesan. Faced with an impossible choice, the character and his lover choose to end their lives together. It is therefore safe to assume that by asking Mariko to die with him in that tea scene, Buntaro is asking his wife for proof of her love for him. But why choose death? The answer lies in Japanese Pure Land Buddhism, where suicide is seen as a courageous act purifying a person's past sins. According to Amidist theology, by ending their lives, lovers are therefore redeemed and able to celebrate an eternal union together in the hereafter. In other words, by dying together, lovers believe that they will be spending eternity together in heaven. This is illustrated in a quote from the famous Chikamatsu play Sonezaki Shinju, which frequently alleges to Pure Land Buddhism theology. On the way to their death, Tokube, the main character, tells his lover, Let's pretend the Umeda Bridge is the bridge the magpies built, which is a reference to legendary celestial lovers across the Milky Way and make a vow to be husband and wife stars forever. Hikamatsu's plays were met with such tremendous success that they helped popularize a more spectacular, dramatic version of Shinju into collective consciousness. His plays were hugely influential on society of his time. His dramatic and romantic portrayal of suicides were particularly captivating for thwarted lovers of his time. 
Chikamatsu often based his plays on real-life events, and young men and women often anticipated that their deaths would be publicized if not immortalized forever in his plays. This pushed hundreds of young couples to end their lives together back in the heyday of his fame, hoping their love would be immortalized in Chikamatsu's work and that they could live their love eternally in the afterlife like his characters. The phenomenon was so widespread in Edo that the Bakufu government banned the publication of Shinju stories in 1723. The government also attempted to discourage the practice by imposing punishments on those who survived unsuccessful attempts. This honor was heaped on courses of those who succeeded, and they were frequently denied burial. Nevertheless, no matter the government's attempt at restricting this new form of Shinju, within a few years, love suicide plays were again written and performed and have continued to be an important theme in Japanese plays and eventually movies up until this day. Incidents of this new form of Shinju, defined as double love suicide, continue to take place in Japanese society over the centuries. There are records of Shinju deaths in the early 20th century, especially among same-sex couples during the imperial years when homosexuality became frowned upon. These incidents have inspired a number of poems and modern plays. If you're interested in reading more on this topic, I will link to an article in the description box below. Today, Shinju continues to be a popular topic in Japanese works of fiction such as mangas and movies. Returning to the TV scene in Shogun, it becomes apparent that it is not historically accurate. The TV show Shogun is supposed to be set in the early 17th century. However, Buntaro's request for his wife to commit Shinju with him, interpreted as lover's suicide, is chronologically incorrect by a century. Shinju was also committed by lovers of the lower classes of society, mostly courtesans and their patrons, not by high-ranking samurai. It is thus important to note that while being a work of historical fiction, Shogun does feature historical inaccuracies. However, this gave me the opportunity to explain the fascinating yet very sad history of Shinju and its evolution throughout Japanese history. I find its roots in Japanese Buddhism particularly interesting. I hope this episode helped you gain insights into the background behind this Shogun scene and into Japanese culture. I hope you enjoyed this episode and you learned something interesting. For more travel insights, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Please make sure you like this video and leave a comment. I will see you in the next episode where I'll be sharing my top 5 places to visit in Kyoto.